Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is in Luke 4, Deliverance, Part 6. Well, we're uh, in our final installment of the subject of deliverance, and this is going to be our sixth one together, and the subject that is a uh, relatively neglected doctrine. Like I said, I can't think of a time I've heard a sermon on deliverance, uh, uh, a Bible study on deliverance, and not many are teaching or preaching the subject, so, so that we've in our journey of Luke, if you will, that we pulled over to the side of the road to consider this uh, topic, I think has been uh, incredibly important. Uh, when we lose grasp of or, or, or never gain understanding of these spiritual truths, of what the Bible teaches, we're susceptible to false teaching. And at the very least, shallow understanding. And when there is no depth, there is no height. And when, when we have a um, superficial understanding of divine truth, we also have a superficial expression of it. And uh, Christians don't look a whole lot different than everybody else. Why? Because we have a superficial understanding of who we're supposed to be and, and we, we need to be different. And we, we learned uh, that the way the Bible distinguishes, again, very important, not the way you distinguish it. Uh, we don't care how you distinguish a Christian. I don't, we don't care how I distinguish a Christian. We care how the truth, how the Bible distinguishes a true Christian from a non-Christian, no matter what the person may claim. The way the, Bible, the way the Bible distinguishes a true Christian from a non-Christian is in this category of deliverance. They've been delivered. Christians are not identified by an event. We ask them, how do you know he's a Christian? Well, I saw him walk forward. Where do you read that in the Bible? I heard him pray a prayer. I saw him cry at the altar. I mean, I'm not against those things. I'm just saying, where in the scriptures do we, does it say that that's what makes a Christian? No, what makes a Christian is that they've been saved, truly. That they've been delivered, that they've prayed some kind of prayer, that they've joined the church, that they've walked forward. None of that stuff's in the Bible, guys. We have to stick to the scriptures. Christians, listen, we've saw, seen several things. First of all, we've looked at the fact that Christians have been delivered from darkness to light. Colossians uh, 12 13 and 14, this is a metaphor, this darkness of light is a metaphor of from error to truth, right? Giving thanks to God the Father, Paul says, Colossians, who has qualified us, notice who, not us, I don't qualify myself, God has qualified me, God has qualified you if you've been delivered and been saved, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light, there's that terminology the from light to darkness for he delivered us from the domain of darkness so we're in light now right we're in we're, but where did we come from we came from the darkness and we couldn't be taken out of there I, I shouldn't say we couldn't take ourselves out of there and we couldn't see in there God has removed us from the domain of darkness and places the domain of light and transferred us to the kingdom as it says there of his beloved son again this is not an intellectual thing it's not because we got smarter someday it was a paradigm shift when we came to Christ and the Holy Spirit came to live in us. And he moved us out of this domain of darkness into the domain of light, out of error, into truth. Do you trust the Holy Spirit? Because he's the one that does this deliverance. He's the one that works it in our lives. Again, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. The anointing, speaking of the Holy Spirit. Speaking of what happens when a person comes to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in them. And we can see that because they start to demonstrate these characteristics of deliverance. Watch. The, the anointing which you have received from him, that's God, abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. Wow. Do you trust the Holy Spirit? Do you trust him? But his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it was taught you, you abide in him. Why, why do you abide in him? Because you're smart? Because you're able? Because you're better than everybody else? No, but because of the anointing, that this, the spirit that's come to live in you, he pulls you out of that, that error and places you into the truth, and he continues to teach the truth. Listen, someone's truly been saved. They've truly been saved. Do you trust the Holy Spirit? They will be pulled out of the darkness. The Holy Spirit will not let them stay there. Do you trust the Holy Spirit? Do you believe he can do his job? So, so it is not true, listen, for us to say that someone is in the kingdom of God who does not believe the truth. Oh, I know that they're a Christian. Now they don't believe the truth. But they're a Christian. What? No, they're not. Because, listen, the spirit of truth leads them into truth 
And so when they demonstrate that they don't believe the truth, they don't have the, they don't have the spirit of truth, guys. We can easily know when someone is under the power of the Holy Spirit and when they're under the power of a lying spirit. And we know that by their response to the truth. Do, do they want the truth? I'm not saying they understand all of it. But do they want it when they see it? Do they grasp at it? Do, do they grow in it? Do, do they go toward it? Or they are just, is it like kryptonite to them? I was like, ah, oh, I don't want that. That's how we know. We can easily know this when someone is under the power of the Holy Spirit or, or under the power of a lying spirit by, uh, where, where a person, listen, is questioning the validity of the Bible, manipulating or either adding to or subtracting from it. That is not the spirit of truth. That is not. Quit calling them a Christian. Where, where they're saying, listen, that there is truth or light somewhere else. Either them or a group of them are saying that. It makes no difference. They are manifesting, listen, the spirit of error. Not the spirit of truth. Because when the spirit of truth comes to reside in you, what? Do you trust the Holy Spirit? Do you trust him? Again, his anointing which you receive from him abides in you and you have no need to anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you, you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Why? Because you've been pulled out. You've been delivered. Christians, listen have been delivered from darkness to light. And in the second category, we've been in past two weeks together. We've been five weeks total, but past two weeks together looking at this whole issue of being delivered from the world to the kingdom of God. What is a Christian? A person who has been delivered from the world to the kingdom of God. Galatians 1, we looked at this the last couple of times. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says in Galatian church, who gave himself for our sins that's an eternal thing and also a, a conditional temper not i mean temporal thing it happens right here and it also happens over there uh, in eternity notice why he delivered us or he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age so so he he, he pulls us out of this uh, paul says in in another place in in ephesians this this uh um Present darkness, he calls it, this present evil age. John calls it the world, the cosmos, this, this system, this plan, this organized system he, that he might deliver us. Jesus has done that by, by dying for us. Deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of, the Father, the, of God the Father. God, God knew we had to be pulled out of this. God knew we were caught in this system. We were caught in darkness. We were caught in the world. And so Jesus comes to rescue us. And yes, he pays for our sins. And yes, he buys us a home in heaven. But he also, in this life, pulls us out of this system. We begin to see, as we talked about last time, uh, a Christian is one who begins to see the, the work of the grand cosmetologist and all the makeup he's applied to this world. Makeup begins to run for them. They may say, wait a minute. I see something different here. They begin to say the world and the plans of the world basically is nothing more than rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. How do they come to that? Because they're smarter? No. Because they've been delivered. Because they've been delivered. That's why we're into deliverance ministry. We want to see people delivered. You can't educate them for that. You can't browbeat them into that. We want them to come into a relationship with the Savior who saves them and delivers them from these things. You can't talk them into that. They can't choose that. They have to be delivered to that. Again, notice again what it says here very clearly. For whatever, notice, is born of God. That's what we're trying to get for people. We just want them born to God, you see. Born once, die twice, right? Born twice, only die once. We want them to be born, not just physically, but also spiritually to God. Whatever is born of God, notice, overcomes the world. 100%. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. What? Our faith. So I place my faith in God's son, Jesus. I trust him. He works the work of, of birthing me again into the kingdom of God and deliver me from, among other things, this worldly way of thinking, this worldly focus. And it's as a result, again, of that spiritual birth, that deliverance. A person, listen, that loves the world, pursues the world, believes with his whole heart, they're not Christians. They're not Christians. For whatever is born of God overcomes 
the world. And so now we're going to do a final topic under this heading of deliverance. And so we've seen that a, a Christian is a person who has been delivered from error to truth, from darkness to light. We've also seen that a Christian is a person who's been delivered from the world to the kingdom of God. And the final installment, our final category, a Christian is a person, listen, who has been delivered from sin to righteousness. A Christian is a person who's been delivered from sin to righteousness. Watch what this says in Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. It says, but God, be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, that's what a, Christ, a non-Christian is. On definition of a non-Christian, they're slaves to sin. They can't do anything else. They can't stop sinning. They can't change. They can't turn over a new leaf. They can't stop and the program and the practice of sin because it owns them. Notice, and that's the terminology here, a slave sin. Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, doctrine to which you were delivered. So why do I obey it? Because I've been delivered, you see. Not because I'm smarter, not because I'm better, but because I've been delivered. I was unable to when I was not a Christian. I was a slave to sin, but now because I've been delivered, I'm able to obey how do we know what a real Christian is? They obey the truth. They obey that doctrine to which they've been delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Slaves of righteousness. A Christian is one who becomes obedient to the truth because they have been delivered. We were enslaved to sin, but we've been set free. And it is a direct result of our deliverance. We didn't acquire it because of our, our position, because we're smart. We are cried it because we've been delivered to it. We've been delivered to it. You can tell who a Christian is because they practice righteousness. Because they practice righteousness. Now, if you would like to turn to a particular passage, I haven't had you turn there yet, but if you would like to go to a place, because we're going to be in a number of verses here in 1 John. If you'd like to go to 1 John chapter 3, maybe you would like to pause me right now and uh, go to 1 John chapter 3. This is going to be on your screen there. I'm going to put them up there, but you're, I would encourage you also to find it in your Bible uh, just because that's a good exercise that you need to know where it is, and this is an important passage. And we're going to be taking on, uh, for the remainder of our time together, this uh, pretty tough passage. Uh, quite misunderstood uh, by some and but so important for us to grasp because this whole issue of deliverance in particular as our topic is today uh, primarily being delivered from sin to righteousness what does that actually mean what does it look like first John chapter 3 are you there first John chapter 3 beginning in verse 2 tells us this beloved now we are the children of God how do you know what that is how do you know what that looks like and then he goes on there very briefly and says, and it was, has not yet been seen what, has not yet been revealed what we shall be. He's going on to talk about our resurrected life and what's that body going to be like and what we're going to be like in heaven and those kind of questions. And Paul says, we haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that yet. So, so we are the children of God currently and, and what that's going to fully mean in the eternal future, Paul says, you know, we haven't seen that yet. God's taking care of that. But here's something, he, if, if you will, if I can read between and write between the lines here for you just briefly. But here's what we can know about the current situation. So, so what we will be, we haven't seen that yet. But we can know this about our current situation. Uh, skipping down to verse uh, 4 and 5, notice what it says. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and the sin is lawlessness. And you know... That he has manifested, that is Jesus, to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. This is not a new concept, right? Jesus died to take away our sins. We, we almost always read that as some kind of eternal classification, and, and I'm not saying that it isn't. In fact, that's the most important part. How, how God classifies you, that, that he no longer classifies you as a sinner, but he classifies you as righteous because of what Jesus did for you. That's the most important thing there is. But listen, it's not the only thing that there is. He, he's not just, it's not just my classification in heaven has changed. My classification on earth has also changed. My, my situation on earth, I've been delivered. I've been delivered from sin to righteousness. So, so, so that you can see he's not just talking about future events. Look at the very next verse. So this is 1 John 3, verses 4 and 5. Look at verse 6. This is a toughie. Like I said, we're going to take it head on because it's in the Bible and also because 
It doesn't need to be tough for us, and this is one of the classic case, cases where our rudimentary language called English bumps up against a much more sophisticated language that the New Testament was written in called the Koine Greek. Part of our problem is we're not able to really shape words the way they could and, and handle and define things the way they could. It was a far more superior language. Uh, 1 John 3.6. Whoever abides in him, that's speaking of Jesus, notice, does not sin. Ooh. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Ooh. Well, that's, that's pretty stringent, isn't it? Now, it almost sounds like a saved person never sins again. Is that what that's saying? Some people interpret it that way. It's incorrect. It's not what it's saying. It's not, again, our problem is our English language, not, not what it's actually saying. It almost sounds like, though, it, it, it just a cursory reading that, that a saved person never sins again. And this can't be true, first of all, because the way John starts his book out, just two chapters before, in uh, 1 John 1, 8 and 9, notice, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I mean, a classification of a true Christian is that they acknowledge that they're sinners, a person going around saying they're not a sinner, well, you automatically know they're not in the truth, as it says there. So, and again, verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So one of the indications of, of, a, of a Christian, and that, that the word of God is in them, how is it in them? Because the Holy Spirit has come to all, like I said, it's a paradigm shift. It's not a matter of in, in, in intelligence or education. It's a matter of the indwelling spirit through the new birth and the delivery process that he has us in. If, so, so the word comes to dwell in me, and part of, that, part of the indication the word's come to dwell in me is that I recognize I'm a sinner. So, so why, why would it be so over here in verse 6, if that's our interpretation, that says we never sin again? He's not contradicting himself. But it does seem that way, again, because of the limitations of our language. This is, just to give you a little Greek here, this is present tense in the Greek. What do I mean by that? It's speaking of a continual action, a, a, a practice, a, a, a program. Uh, uh, the same that's conveyed back in verse 4, uh, if, if you'll look. It says, practice, the one who practices sin practices lawlessness. It's the same, same term here. In other words, a true believer, listen, does not continue in a pattern or a practice of sin. Doesn't mean he never sins. Doesn't mean he doesn't mess up at times. Just means that's not who he is. He doesn't like it anymore. Doesn't love it anymore. Remember back, back to our, our passage there in Romans. He's he's not enslaved to it anymore. It's not where he gets his whole meaning from anymore. Because that's what it means to be lost. They're enslaved to it. They they can't break from it. They love it, and their whole life revolves around it. And that's a part of what it means. A part of the definition of what it means to be a lost person. But a saved person, listen, is not like that anymore. He now practices. Listen has a pattern of righteousness. He practices righteousness. A true Christian believes God's word and wants to obey it. Again, because he's smarter, no. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in him. The spirit of truth is leading him into truth. Give credit where credit's due. As a pattern of life and a practice of righteousness, the pattern wasn't there before, but now it is. Because they have been delivered. Practicing righteousness, listen, didn't save them. But they practice righteous because they've been saved. Because I've been delivered, I practice righteousness. It didn't save me. I was saved to it. I was delivered to it. I now love righteousness. I now love what's right. I now love the truth. I don't always do it. I mess up at times, but my practice, listen, is righteousness. When, when we say, as an illustration, when we say that a doctor has a practice, what are we saying? We say, as a pattern of life, this is what he does. He practices medicine. It's the same terminology here. It, it, uh, it's, he, we practice righteousness, not because we're perfect. Again, if we say that we're perfect, the truth isn't in us. We saw that, right? If we say that we are, this is not claiming perfection for a Christian in any way. It does say, listen, you've been delivered to a new practice. You've been delivered to a new pattern. 
be delivered. Your heart is changed. You couldn't change it. No one else could, but God did. Christians, listen, practice righteousness, whereas they used to practice sin. It's just as simple as that. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, look at verse 7. Again, we're pulling this apart one by one so that we can get all that's here. Little children, let no one deceive you. There's a lot of deception going on out there. There's a lot of, of inability within our churches to have discernment. We've kind of wrapped our arms around uh, worldly things and worldly people, and we started calling them Christians. Why? Because, like I said, shallow understanding of divine truth is, gives shallow uh, uh, um, display of it. And so we become very shallow, and in the shallow end, all kinds of stuff gets in there, and that's what's happening. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Now, that's pretty simple, isn't it? He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. Don't let them deceive you, because that's what people do. Righteous people do righteous stuff. That's not hard. So if they're living an unrighteous life, continually practicing it, we cannot call them, by the Bible, Christians. We cannot do it. How do we know when a person's been delivered? They practice righteous. Delivered people practice righteous stuff, and undelivered people don't. It's not that complicated. Verse 8. He who sins... <laughs> wow. So, so this may seem harsh to you, but this is exactly what, devil, what, what Jesus said. He says, why, he says to the Pharisees, why can't you hear my words? Why can't you understand me? Because you're of your father, the devil. It's either one or the other. You either have God as your father or you have the devil as your father. There's not a middle ground here. It's not, oh, well, they're good lost people. No, they're not. No, they're not. He who sins is of the devil, practices sin. How do we know? Because they demonstrate who their dad is by the way that they live. Their dad is a devil. That's the way he is. So what do they do? They do the same as their dad. And again, this is going to be important because our next verse is going to be underscoring this the other way. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. So we, all, uh, uh, we say all the time the opposite of this though, right? We do. Uh, uh, they're doing wrong. They're living out there uh, a sinful life. They've been doing it for a long time, but I know they're saved. <laughs> Based on what? What biblical criterion demonstrates? Oh, because they walk forward, they pray to prayer, they cry, they took the pastor's hand. Where do you read that in the Bible? Again, I'm not against that stuff. But it's only a means to an end. Were they truly converted? Were they truly saved? Were they truly delivered? Evidence is prolific to that effect, one way or the other. I know they've been saved, but they live an unbroken pattern of sin in their lives. Why are you calling them a Christian? Why, from the Bible, why are you calling them a Christian? Verse 9. Whoever, here, hear this issue again, has been born of God does not sin. Again, that whole issue is practicing sin. Whoever's been born of God doesn't practice sin. They just don't. So you got some old boy over here who's practicing sin in his life, an unbroken pattern of, of sin, even though he came forward, even though he cried, even though he joined a church. What have we got? You got a non Christian. For how, how do we know that? Because when they're born of God, they don't do that. For God's seed, his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. He cannot live in this practice and pattern of sin because he's been pulled out of it, he's been delivered from it, right? He, he's been delivered from it. I mean, you, you think about it. It's as, as a virtue of our birth into the kingdom of God, as it says there, because we've been born of God. As a virtue of our birth into the kingdom of God, we don't practice sin anymore as a pattern. We don't want it anymore. I'm not saying we don't fall into it. I'm not saying we're perfect. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. But I am saying it's not what we want anymore. We don't want to stay in it, and, and a person who's truly saved will not. They will not. Think about it. Let's get back to this whole issue of, the, of, of birth. When a child is born to parents, that child is limited genetically. What is he limited to? He's limited to the genes he gets from two people, mom and dad. Whatever they can bring to the table, 
That's all he's got to draw from, both physically and, in some cases, intellectually. He really can't go beyond them. He really can't, and yet we find ourselves all the time, we say, and of course I do too, and, and I know you do, when a child grows up and, and looks like his dad or looks like his mom or looks like both of them, isn't that cool? He looks like his mom and dad. What choice did he have? He didn't have, he didn't have 30 moms and dads to choose from. He's only got two. And so, of course, he's going to look like them. He's going to sound like them. Physical characteristics and even intellectual characteristics, in some ways emotional characteristics, they're going to be like them. Because he only had that as an option. By virtue, listen, of who he was born to. This is very important. By virtue, listen, listen, of being born again, we're going to look like our father. That's what John is saying. Because you've been born again, we don't continue in this pattern of sin. It literally is a paradigm shift. It's not a matter of education. I've said this. It's not a matter of being smart. It's not a matter of they've had better teachers or better preachers. It's because they have had the Holy Spirit come and live in their lives. They've been delivered by that, and he's delivered them to a place where they look like their father. They are limited, listen, to their spiritual genes, which have come from their father. By being born again means that they practice, the practice of sin has been broken. So if someone claims to be a Christian, they look like that, that way for a while. They come and join the church, but then they leave. They go away. They go back to the, what they had always been. And they stay there. Not a Christian. Not a Christian. You heard them pray the prayer. Listen, that prayer is not a formula. It's not some kind of incantation. They had to have had a conversion in the heart where they personally trusted the Savior. There's not a prayer that can lead them to that. It's a matter of their heart. It's a matter of their heart. Verse 10. One more. 1 John 3.10. And listen, again, John is hitting it, I mean, very detailed and very specific here. And this, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. That's pretty clear, right? He's about to draw a dividing line. Children of God, children of the devil. Like I said, there's only two categories in the whole world. Either you're saved and a child of God, and you're going to, listen, demonstrate the virtues of that birth into the kingdom of God, or you're unsaved and are of the kingdom of the devil and are a child of the devil and are going to demonstrate virtues of that spiritual genetics. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother. So the dividing line is this obedience thing. This practice thing. Does not practice righteousness He's not of God. It's not a matter of trying harder. It's not a matter of, the, of anything like that. Their desires change. We come to the place because of the deliverance God has brought in our lives where we hate sin and we love right, what is right. I mean, one of the things about that, that we're going to love, listen, about heaven is the fact that there's not going to be sin there. It's not, not the gold streets. Oh, boy, the streets are going to be gold. You know what? If it's full of sin, I don't want to be there. It's not about the gold streets. It's about the sinlessness of that place. We live in a world that's becoming more and more about just simply managing sin. It's not a matter of whether they're lying. It's just who lying more than the other ones, right? We, we live in a world like that. I hate that stuff. Do you? Listen, it's a characteristic of a believer. They hate it. Part, part of the greatness of being in heaven is going to be, and we're going to be in a place where we are, there, are no, there is no sin there. There was no sin. And it's beyond our conception to understand what that's really like. But it's going to be awesome. So again, deliverance. What is it? You can't teach it to someone. You can't browbeat them into it. You may get them to stop externally. You can legislate morality right to a certain degree. I can make you stop doing stuff. But listen, you will not change them inside. You will not change their heart. They have to be delivered. 
They have to be born again. They have to be saved. And that's why we're in this ministry. We're not here just to teach good morals. We're not here to teach one more way, one more religion. Of what good are we doing if that's all we're doing? No, we're here to get them people into contact with the Savior, with the Deliverer, who changes them and shifts them into another world, literally the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of righteousness. When a person comes to Christ, they're delivered to it. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your deliverance. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can trust you. We worry about ourselves. Don't really know if we can live this Christian life. It's great to know that we're not supposed to live this Christian life. We're allow you to live that Christian life through us. So we want to surrender ourselves right now to the, to the indwelling Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, we want you to work your work in us. We want the world to see that we've been delivered. We pray, Lord, that, um, that you would help us to repent and turn away from our sin. Help us, Lord, to, to see it. Open our eyes to it. Help us to run away from this um, uh, lie that's put out there in our world, this, this makeup that is intended to deceive. Help us to turn away from the things that are false. Deliver us from falsehood, God, and deliver us to the truth. We know that you're doing that. We know that you are. Continue to grow us, Lord. Thank you for this time we've had as we pulled over to the side of the road to check out this great doctrine of deliverance. Thank you for teaching us, God. I pray you bless this into our hearts and lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.